Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. And we've been sharing Jesus' last words, so we'll look at the last chapter in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we'll look at those and, and see what they have to say. And, and one of the things we notice in the Bible is that we who are believers, we who embrace Christianity as our faith, we have a commission. We have a commission. That means a command of a mission. And we've been given the mission to share Jesus' love and share the message of Christ and, and share the gospel with everyone everywhere and, and, and not pick and choose who we think we want to share our faith with and share the good news that God sent the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth, not so we could have a holiday or two, not so we could celebrate Christmas, not so we could celebrate Easter, not so we could just say, oh yeah, I know about Jesus, I know who he is, yep, yep, I got it. I got it. Or not so we could just say, I'm a Christian because I live in America. Over 80% of the people who live in America claim the term Christian. But Christian means a Christ-like one. And so if I'm going to call myself a Christian, I can't just say I live in America. I can't even just say I go to church once in a while, maybe twice a year, like Christmas and Easter. I have to say I'm a Christ-like one. What was he like? I don't know that without reading the Bible. That's the document that reveals his life and his ministry, his sacrificial death, the fact that he was forgiving and caring and merciful and compassionate and provided for people in need. All of those things would be necessary if I'm going to call myself a Christian. But it doesn't start there. It doesn't start with me just imitating Jesus and doing what Jesus did. It starts with an exercise of faith by accepting personally what he did. What he did, he did for the whole world, but not many people accept it. Not many people receive it. The Bible calls it a minority of people. It says, few there be that find it. The Lord Jesus Christ descended from heaven, came and, and was born in, 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 in Bethlehem. We know all the Christmas songs, but he grew up and he came for a, for a distinct purpose. And the, the distinct purpose that he came had nothing to do with Christmas carols. It had to do with a cross that looks something like the one over there on the right side of the front of our sanctuary where he hung, where he was crucified, where he died. And the Bible tells us he did that willingly for our sins. Amen. He himself willingly and purposely suffered and died and paid the price for all sin. Now, does that mean every sin is wiped out or forgiven? No, it means every sin can be wiped out and forgiven, but you have to request that. You have to come. You have to put faith in what he did on that cross, according to our Bible. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, as you can see it up here, every, every scripture I quote is right up here on the screen, and it says, you, you read it with me, but as many as received him. Now wait, 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 as many as received him. What's the previous verse say? The previous verse says he came to his own, but his own rejected him. His own did not receive him, but to as many as receive him. To them he gives this promise, this privilege, this ability, this honor to become the children of God, even those who believe on his name, even those who believe on his name. It's not complicated. It's, it's simple. It's making a personal decision to accept what he did, to accept what he did for you and make him your savior. That means he's the one you trust in to save you, to forgive you, to bring you into everlasting life. If you don't trust in Jesus, then you have to trust in something else. If you think that after this lifetime, you're going to step into heaven, you're going to be in God's presence, what's going to take you there? What, when faced with the question, why should you be, entered, why should you be allowed to enter in to the kingdom of God, to the presence of the eternal Father, why should you be able to do that? Well, because somebody sprinkled water on my head when I was a baby. We don't have any verse in the whole Bible that says that forgives sins. None anywhere. Well, because I went to catechism, because I went to confirmation. Those aren't bad things, but nowhere in the Bible does it say going to some classes 
causes you to be cleansed and forgiven of all your sins. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. What it does say is, and we sing a song, it goes like this, what shall wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not my good works, not my good life, not my promise to do better, not what my grandparents did or my parents did or my godparents did, not what anybody else did, but what Jesus did. What he did, see, if I could live a good life and my grandparents and my parents could pray for me and they both lived a good life and, and, and the preacher could pray for me and I could go through a couple classes and that was all it took, Jesus Christ didn't have to leave heaven, did he? Because I could do it without him. You can't do it without him. That's the whole design of God's plan, that you cannot do this life and you can't do into the next life on your own. It takes God's help. It takes God's grace. It takes God's goodness. It takes God's love. It takes God's mercy. And it takes God's son. He only said, he didn't send, well, uh, uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent 14 angels and, and, and he sent the Holy Spirit and, and he, he, he sent a couple of the saints that had died and gone on first and he sent them back because they'd be good examples too. And so he sent back Moses and Elijah and Joshua and, and Daniel. And if you believe in any of those, you're in. That's not what it says. It says, for God so loved the world, he gave, let's read it together again. For God so loved the world, he gave his only, only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We've been looking at the last words of Jesus. The last words that he spoke and there are different categories of his last words. You can take his last words to his disciples. Remember those? John chapter 12 and 13 when he has the Last Supper and he speaks to them. Those are his last words to them in Gethsemane when he talks to them about prayer. Or his last words on the cross. There were seven things that he said on the cross. And then he died and he descended and he paid the penalty for all sin for three days and nights. And then he rose from the grave. And then what happened? He spoke again. And so we've been looking at some of the last things that he said. And what we saw last week here at the end of Matthew and at the end of Mark and at the end of Luke and at the end of, 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 of John and then into the book of Acts was that we, we were all commissioned with two things. Sharing the gospel... Every Christian is commissioned to share the gospel with who? Everyone. Everyone. Can't pick and choose. Might be your neighbor that you don't get along with. Might be that person at work that you can't stand. Might be the person at work that can't stand you. Might be that one relative that's bossy and nosy. You have one, huh? All right, sharing the gospel and, and making disciples. Now, my, ran, my, my friend Ray Howell, he, he has an interesting way of, of putting this. It's a, and the way he puts it is being a disciple, making disciples. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly true. That, that as a Christian, it's not enough for you just to receive Jesus, to read a gospel track and pray the prayer at the end. Paula and I went out for her birthday last night and uh, took her to a fine restaurant. We had a really, really good meal. And then we went for a walk. We needed it. And while we were out walking, why, here come a man we'd never seen before. Here he come, and, and he stopped, spoke to a couple of young ladies, and, they, and they, they brushed him off and said, no, 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 no. And he looked at us coming up the sidewalk, and you could just see in his eyes there were crosshairs. We were his next target. And he just came right up and said, I'm just down here in the park sharing the love of Jesus. Could I give you a track? I said, you sure, you sure could. Thanks for loving Jesus. We do too with all of our hearts. He said, praise the Lord. We did too. We went on our way and he went to a next target. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. He's just out there sharing the love of Jesus. Not just with people he knew, although I still, can, I still maintain that friendship evangelism is the most effective. 
And that's you just make friends, you have relationships, you know people. Now, it's not just your friends. I mean, my dad's got a stirring, rousing testimony of one of his worst enemies in life and how he got to go and he just got to sit down and how he got to share the gospel with them uh, um, like three days before they stepped into eternity and they accepted Jesus Christ. See, they're not accepting you. Don't worry about whether they like you or not. Yeah, yeah, share the gospel with everyone. The good news is that you don't have to go to hell. The good news is not you're going to hell, you rank sinner. That's not the good news. The good news is you don't have to go. Jesus paid the price so that nobody would have to go. Just accept what he did and put your faith in what he did. His blood is enough to forgive every sin you've ever committed or ever will. And then secondly, after you accept Christ, after they pray the prayer on the back of that track, after they put their faith and hope and trust and reliance and confidence in the one that God sent and they accept and receive him by faith, not join a church, not, 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 not start some set of rules and regulations. No, accept Jesus. Then step two is make disciples. And that's what he said right there at the end of, at the end of Matthew. Make disciples. What does that mean? Help them. Help them in their faith walk. Help them get a good church where they can meet other Christians, where they can learn and grow. Encourage them. Well, I don't even know what to encourage them. I make disciples. What would I encourage them to do? Read their Bible. That's step one. That's where I started all of this whole line just a few minutes ago. Encourage people to read their Bible. They don't even have a Bible. Get them one. Buy them one. Take them to a Christian bookstore. Get online and buy them a Bible. Amen. Buy them a Bible. And, and we've got free Bibles. We give them away. Back here, anybody that doesn't have a Bible, we just give them a Bible. Well, I wouldn't know where to start. Well, well, listen a little, little carefuler then, yes. because I tell you where to start. The, the Gospel of Mark. Yes. Because that's my name. No, no, it's not, it's got nothing to do with my name. It's, it's, it's short. It's, it's easy to read. Just start reading the book of Mark. It's only 16 chapters. And then read the book of Luke. And then read the book of Acts. Because Luke wrote the book of Acts. That's a history book. It's easy reading. Come back and, and, and read Matthew and, and Mark and Luke and John and Acts and, and, and focus their attention mostly on the New Testament. Encourage them as well to read the book of Proverbs. 31 chapters, and you can read one chapter every day of the month. And, and don't even have to keep track. Just say, today's the 14th. All right, so I'm, Proverbs chapter 14. It's called the book of wisdom. Yeah. And it gives you wisdom in just nearly every arena and area and realm of life and living. Help them by teaching them how to pray. You know, most people make prayer far too complicated. Far too complicated. We sat down at that restaurant last night, and that, that, that uh, uh, helpful little waitress, she came over and said, well, good evening. Uh, how are you today? And, and we said, we're doing really wonderful. It's my wife's birthday, and we're here to celebrate. How are you, young lady? She said, well, I'm just doing fine. You know, we were just communicating with her. We didn't have to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah. Oh, thou, oh, put on this religious voice to pray, and, and we're, we're going to order if it shall be thy will, and now, and now omnipotent providence, I, I would like an appetizer of a shrimp cocktail. If you could see it within thy will to, to bring it, if, if, it's, if it's part of your provision, and if it's part of your lifelong plan for me, I'd like a little cocktail sauce off on the side. Oh, God. I just said, we'd like a shrimp cocktail. I don't treat God like a waitress. Take me wrong. There's a reverence. He's the almighty one. And I learn when I read that Bible what kind of things he really does want for, for me and for my life. And, and, and all of prayer is not making a request and saying, this is what I want. You're the waitress. I'm going to give you my order. That's how people treat God. But see, my point is, we had a conversation before I asked for anything. We had a conversation before I ever asked for anything. She poured water in the glasses. We didn't even have to ask, so I thanked her for what she'd already given us. So I start talking to my God, and I just say, Lord, I'm just so grateful. And I, just, I usually start prayer with, with gratitude, with thankfulness, with what I'm appreciative for. Uh, he didn't, not what I got today, not that I get everything I want. He's not Santa Claus. And, and so I, I just start at gratitude. And you can start people, you can help them pray in that way. Just tell them, prayer's easy. 
A lot of people, come on up here and pray for the service. Pray for this, pray for that. Oh, I, I'm not a very good prayer. What's a good prayer? Amen. Some of that sounds poetic and esoteric. Just talk to the Lord yes. like you'd talk to anybody else. Right. He's not like anybody else. You do reverence our God yeah. and, and, and realize all things work after the counsel of his own will and that he's sovereign. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing, he's all-wise, and, and, and he is God. And recognize that when you pray. But when you disciple people, have, get them started reading their Bible, get them started praying, and get them in a good church. That's it. You, you, you've got a good start. Yeah. You've got a good start. Don't worry about explaining the whole book of Revelation verse by verse, line by line. They need to know that. They need to know how to come to church and learn about the Lord. That's making disciples. So, so we've, we've looked at those verses. I just want to start by encouraging you again. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Book of Acts. They all talk about Jesus commissioning every believer to share the gospel with everyone. To love people. To care about people. To be compassionate enough with people to share the good news of Jesus with everyone everywhere. And then in the Book of Acts, he says in verse 8 of chapter 1, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power. You'll be empowered. We heard this morning about how, how the Lord will actually equip you and anoint you and empower you to be a mom. You know, too many people, they don't, they don't think of the spiritual nature of parenthood. Just like they don't, speak, see, they don't seem to realize the spiritual nature of their job. They don't walk into their place of employment and say, Lord, help me. Anoint my eyes, anoint my mind, anoint my hands. Help me, help me, and, and, and he will. And he really will. And they don't get up in the morning and say, Lord, help me be a better dad. Help me be a good dad. Help me be a great dad. Help me be a dad to these, to these kids right here. They don't get up in the morning and say, Lord, uh, I've done this so many times. I mean, I'm not on number eight, you know, and I've been doing this for about 14 years. And so I really don't need help. I got this. <laughs> Woo, you got eight. You need God's help. Yeah. And you need God's help if you have one yeah. on the way. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, uh, we, we, had, we had neighbors growing up had 17. Who said, oh boy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Vanettas. They had 17 kids. And I mean, they had, they had kids having kids while they were still having kids. They were a farm family. You know it. You know they had a big old dairy farm. And, and, and uh, uh, praise the Lord. God bless them. They need, yeah, they need God's help. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but everybody does. Start your day by just saying, Lord, help me. Help me be a good husband. Help me be a good wife. Help me be a good mom. Help me. He will. He will. He'll help you. He designed the family system. He designed the family structure. He designed marriage to be what it is. He did. It's right here in his book. Third chapter. Excuse me. Excuse me. Second chapter. Yeah, the second chapter of the whole Bible. We see, we see God talking about marriage uh, and family, first chapter, replenish and, and multiply and have kids and, and have a family. And that's all part of God's intent, part of God's design and part of God's plan. And he'll help you with that. He'll help you with that. Now, he's not going to come down and, 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 and appear in a ball of fire. and There's going to be thunder and smoke and lightning flashes and say, I am here to help you. You just ask in faith. And, and, and realize his Holy Spirit, who's everywhere, filling all places with his presence at all times, he'll assist you. Won't do it for you, but he'll assist you if you ask. If you don't ask, you're on your own. But ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and that door then will be open. Now, as we go on from Acts chapter 1, we see just a couple of other places in the book of Acts where the Lord Jesus actually spoke. He actually said something. And, and those are in red uh, when, when those are recorded, if you have a red letter edition. In Acts chapter 18, we see that Jesus spoke to Paul in verse 9 and said, Be not afraid, speak. Do not keep quiet, for I am with you. 
and no man shall hurt you, for I have many people in this city. In chapter 20 and verse 25, excuse me, 35, Acts 20, 35, we shared this last week, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. In chapter 22, Paul gives the account of his meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, and we have the account of what Jesus said there in verse 7, 8, and 10. Down a little bit farther in that chapter, we see that Jesus spoke to Paul when he came to Jerusalem. And then the last time in the book of Acts that we have the account of Jesus speaking. So this would be the last words of Jesus that are recorded in the book of Acts. Now Paul is standing here uh, and he's before King Agrippa and he's testifying. He's telling his story. He's giving his testimony. What's yours? Yeah, what's yours? What's your testimony? I can tell you my testimony. I was nine years old. As a nine-year-old boy, I sat in a church service. There was a man who was a traveling evangelist and came to our church in Cedarville, Illinois. There was one row right down the center, and there were pews on each side of this little white frame church. And my mom brought our family. Uh, it was, a, it was a, during the week, and, and uh, we got there late. And we pulled in the back door and slipped in the back row. And he was sharing the gospel, the simple gospel message that Jesus is God's son. He came to, he came to earth to save us. And, and he died on the cross. And if you would place your personal faith in him and accept him as your savior, you'll be born again. Well, I'd never heard anything like that. I was nine years old. Nobody asked me to go. My mom didn't nudge me and say, you want to go accept Christ? No, nothing like that. I just got out of that back, aisle, back pew, walked right up the center of the aisle, knelt right on the left side of the altar, and accepted Jesus personally uh, as my Savior. I'd never done that. But I did that night. And I didn't have a 10-ton weight on my shoulders that seemed to be lifted off. I, I, I couldn't think of uh, a long list of sins to repent of. I was nine. Hadn't killed anybody, hadn't robbed anybody, hadn't committed adultery, hadn't stolen, hadn't, hadn't, had, well, I might have told a lie, I don't remember. But I just asked forgiveness and it was all wiped away like that, like that windshield. Yeah. Everything was clean. That's my story. That's my story. Now, there's a whole lot of other elements in my story, but see, I can only share mine. I can't share yours. Paul didn't share anybody else's story. He shared his story. That's known as your testimony. And you can share it with people. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Yeah, what, what used to you to be, and then what the Lord did to you, and for you, and in you, and what you are now. Amen. Amen. You don't have to give every detail. Paul, we don't even know all the details of Paul's life. He just said, it's nothing to be proud of. He said, I'm the chief of all sinners. That's what he said. So I could be an example of the mercy of God. Amen to all that would come after me. Well, here he talks about he's traveling to Damascus and he's on that road. And he meets who? You see, he doesn't meet a church. He doesn't meet a Bible floating in the air. He doesn't meet some Christian music on a, on, a, on, a, on a radio. He meets the living Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified, died, buried, and who rose from the grave, who's resurrected. That's who he met on that road. This was years after that crucifixion. The early church was just starting to gain traction and just starting to expand, just starting to evangelize the world in chapter 8 of the book of Acts. In chapter 9, here's Paul, the great persecutor of the church, and he's marching up to a new city to make trouble for Christians, and he meets someone right in the way. Brighter than the noonday sun, the power of whom caused everyone to fall flat to the earth. And that individual was the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he said, I am Jesus. Verse 15, I am Jesus whom you persecute. 
but rise. Now here, these are the words of Jesus, and it's the only time in the whole Bible it is recorded this way. And, and Paul, is he, he's, he shared bits and pieces and snippets of it before now, but now he's going to tell us everything Jesus said. He said, I am Jesus who you persecute, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister. Now, wait a minute. He didn't want to be a minister. You know what? Sometimes the Lord just doesn't care what you want. He said, he wanted to be a church destroyer. He wanted to be a Christian murderer. He wanted to be somebody who, 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 who separated families and ripped up households and, and, and tore down Christianity. That's what he wanted to do. And the Lord just said, I've appeared to, unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister. Oh, I bet you he said, oh, hallelujah. I'm so happy. Oh, happy day. He, no, he, this is the Lord saying, I've chosen this for you. At some point, you have, to just, you have to just get down off your high horse and realize there's somebody greater than you. Amen. He's the Lord of all creation. He's the Lord of the entire universe. And he has a will for every human being. And for this human being right here, he said, you're going to be my minister. Now watch this. I've appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness. Both of the things which you have seen and the things to which I will appear unto you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Uh, you probably don't read into it, but he was a Jew. He couldn't even talk to Gentiles. He couldn't even be in the presence of Gentiles. He couldn't have any fellowship or communion with Gentiles. He, he couldn't have commiserate with them. He couldn't even converse with them. And here's the Lord of heaven appearing to him and saying, I'll make you a minister and I'm sending you to the Gentiles. He's flipping his doctrine upside down right out of the gate, right from the first minute of day one. Delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. And here we go. Verse 18. This is our text for this morning. Acts chapter 26 and verse 18. This is why I appeared to you. This was his commission. This is what he was told to do. The Apostle Paul. The last words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke in any of the Gospels or the book of Acts. Paul, I'm sending you. You're going to be my minister. And this is what you're going to do. Number one. And there are seven elements to this. Seven different elements to this commission that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to the Apostle Paul. Seven. The first is what? To open their eyes. To open their eyes eyes, to open their eyes. Now, Psalm 119, you can look up here on the screen, Psalm 119 says in verse 18, Psalm 119, verse 18, well, let's read it all. They can put that verse up, but I'm just going to read all of this. I'm sending you, I'm delivering you from the people, and I'm sending you to the Gentiles to do what? To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so the first thing he says here is, uh, I want you to go and I want you to open their eyes. Now, uh, how many people do you know in life that just walk around with their eyes closed? Do you, anybody here, you just go all through life, you got here today, you drove here today with your eyes closed? I followed somebody I think theirs were, but... <laughs> Any of you vacuum your house with your eyes closed? Dust? Don't let your husband do that. It'll look like he did. Any men change the oil in your car with your eyes closed? We don't do anything with our eyes closed but sleep. Maybe dive into the water. Maybe walk through the smoke. But we live with our eyes open. Human beings live with their eyes open, and human beings live under the deception that they're seeing everything clearly. And God is not sending the Apostle Paul 
to help people open these natural eyelids so that they can see the trees and bushes and clouds and, and, and all the features of nature uh, and other people. He's not talking to them about the, the spherical green, brown, blue, little orbs, pupils uh, within, within the, the, the sockets in the front of your skull. He's not talking about opening those eyes. He says, open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. In Psalm 119, verse 18, we read that, that, that the psalmist is, is praying and he's crying out to God, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your word. Yeah. See, it's not these eyes that comprehend and grasp and understand the wonderful things from the word of God. It's not, it's not these eyes right here that get that. There's another set of eyes that he's talking about here and, uh, that, that, that he wants opened up so that people understand there is darkness and there is light. And many human beings, I'd have to say most human beings, are wandering and stumbling and fumbling and bumbling through the darkness and they don't even know it's dark. And he said, I'm going to send you to open their eyes. Now here, it says, open my eyes. This is a great prayer for Christian people. This is a great prayer for believers. This is a great prayer that you could pray, Lord, open my eyes so that I can behold the wondrous things out of your word. We've shared many times from Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, he talks about opening my eyes to see things that you've done for me, that you've provided for me. It says, this is a prayer. The last word of verse 16 is prayer. I give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, number one, the spirit of wisdom. Number two, Revelation in the knowledge of Him. Number three, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's exactly what he's talking about right here. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That you'd turn from darkness to light. That you wouldn't wander around in the dark anymore, stumbling, bumping your toe, running into things but that your eyes would be opened and the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. And then it gives three things, and I'll just quickly go through them, come back to one later. That you'd know, number one, the hope of his calling. Number two, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Number three, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Over in Colossians, just, just we're so close there, Colossians chapter 1, specifically verse 9, it says, for this cause, since the day we heard it, we don't cease to pray for you and desire. What is it that he's desiring for these church people? That they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom, and here it is again, spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. When he says to Paul, I'm going to, have, I'm going to send you to open their eyes, it's not because they walk around with their eyes closed. It's not because they're physically blind. It's not because they have cataracts. It's not because they have glaucoma, macular degeneration. It's got nothing to do with these eyes out here. It's got to do with their spiritual understanding. They don't discern that they're still in the dark. They don't know that they need anything. They don't realize they need help. Say to people, you need to cry out for, the, for help from the Lord. Why would I need help? I'm, I'm getting along okay. I mean, I've got a house, I've got a car, I've got a job, I've got a family, uh, I've got a little bit of money in the bank. Hey, I've got cable TV. <laughs> got a computer. What, what, what do I need help for? Completely in the dark and understanding you're separated from God. You have no relationship. You have no walk with Him. Your life is going to go on. You're going to have some fun. You're going to have some enjoyment. You're going to survive. And then at the end, you're going to be banished from God's presence forever. And He doesn't want that. He wants you to be in His presence forever. But the only doorway that exists into His presence is His Son. 
His son Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There's a very narrow doorway, and it's through him. It's through his sacrifice because that, he's the only one God gave. Everything else is man invented. Every other way to heaven is man invented. The only thing he gave is his son. Everything else humans have come up with. Well, if you do this, if you do that, if you do this, if you do that, if you do that, if you do this, if you do this, if you do the other. No, the only thing that, that, that he provided as a way into his presence for eternity is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. It's that simple. I like simple. I don't have to scratch my head and say, I got, let's see, I got door A, door B, door C, door B, door D, door, door E. I, I don't know which one to chose. I hate watching, what, what's that? What's, what, um, Let's make a deal. I hate it. I hate it. Door one, two, and three. Uh, oh, 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 three. And I go, ding, number one. <laughs> Aren't you glad you don't have to just pick door one, two, or three? And if you get it wrong, you have to go to hell for all of eternity to suffer and die and, and experience everlasting death and pain and solitude and, and, and horrible agony because you picked the wrong door? You go up in front of the Almighty God and he says, pick any door you want. Door number one, 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 door number one. They're all Jesus, my son. He's the only one I sent. It's the only way to God. The only way to eternity in his presence. It's that simple. I can even get that. The Bible says not even a wayfaring fool will enter into this. There's hope for me. And there's hope for you and there's hope for every human. Amen. Except the ones that argue and say it can't be that simple. I didn't make it simple. The eternal God made it simple enough that, that even humans can get it. Yeah, amen. Amen. Now, now, turn in your Bible to the Old Testament, back to 2 Kings. It'll be right after 1 Kings. And, and, and it's, it's about... Oh, maybe a quarter of the way through the Old Testament. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. If you hit Psalms or Proverbs, keep going back to the left till you find second Kings. You might be sitting next to somebody that knows where it's at and, and they can even help you find it. There's a table of contents right in the front of your Bible. It tells you where all the, all the books are. So second Kings, this is the second letter of the Kings. And we're going to look at chapter six. We're going to look at chapter 6. Open their eyes, Jesus said to Paul. I'm sending you to open their eyes. And this is such a, such a great account. This is such a great story that he saw fit to include in the Bible. And it's a story of a prophet. Everybody say a prophet. And this man was a prophet. He didn't just have the title that he self-ascribed to him and hung, hung on himself. He, he, he is a prophet. And, and, and this prophet... Uh, uh, he, he, he actually is acting on behalf of, of his nation. And every time the Syrian troops come to attack, he informs the king where the attack is coming. And they muster the troops and they get out there and they defend against it. And the Syrian king gets quite agitated. And the Syrian king thinks he's got a spy. And so one day the Syrian king just says, okay, uh, I'm going to interrogate all of you. That means like torture until I find out who's the spy. And one of them stands up and says, King, there's no spy in our midst. There's a prophet in theirs. He knows everything. And he said, well, then let's just go get this prophet. And so by nighttime, he sends all of his Syrian troops out there, the whole army. Estimates are 60 to 80,000 troops to surround this little village where Elisha the prophet is staying. And we'll just pick it up in chapter 14, or excuse me, verse 14. 2 Kings 6, 14. Therefore he sent horses and chariots, a great host, and they came by night and they encircled the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose up early and went out, behold, a host encompassed the city, horses and chariots. And the servant said, my master, my master, what shall we do? And so, and, and, and so here you have it. Here's, here's Elisha and here's his single employee. He's got a thriving entrepreneurship. 
He's got one person. That, and, 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 and he goes out in the morning, he gets up, you can just see him stretch, and grab the water bucket, and, 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 and down to the well he goes, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And he looks, and there's just horses and spearmen and chariots and soldiers with their swords drawn. Everywhere he looks, and he drops the bucket, and he runs back to Elisha. And he says, my master, my master, what are we going to do? Now, let me ask you this. Of his five physical senses, which one just got him in trouble? His eyes. Not his taste, not his smell. Not his hearing, not the sense of touch or feeling. What he saw, his eyes were open. He looked out, he saw that massive assembly of Syrian troops, and he ran back to Elisha and said, My master, what shall we do? Look at verse 16. And Elisha answered, Do not be afraid, for they that are with us are more than with them. See, this is, where, this, is where, this is where people who don't have their eyes open spiritually, like that servant, like that servant boy, they're in the dark. He's just totally in the dark. He's so scared. He's terrified. He's saying, look at all these troops. And then he goes back to the man of God, and the man of God says, what, what are you troubled about? There are more with us than there are with them. Wouldn't you like to have seen that servant, the look on his face right then? Yes. Boss, there's two of us. And there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 75,000 troops, a thousand troops out there, and there's you and me. And you can just see this prophet going, oh boy, how long will I be with you? So Elisha prays. Look at this prayer in verse 17. Elisha prays and says, Lord, I pray, Open his eyes that he may see. Wait a minute. That's what got him in trouble was his eyes and what he saw. What is Elisha praying? Lord, open his eyes that he may see. He had his eyes open. It registered through his optical nerve up into his brain. It sent quivers and shivers and goosebumps all over his body. His, 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 his hormones started going nuts. And he started, he was, he was scared because of what he saw. And, and Elisha prays, open his eyes. That's exactly what he prayed. Open his eyes that he may see. See? Lord, help. Help the people around me. Open their eyes that they may truly see. Lord, help every person who's never made a commitment to Christ. Open their eyes that they may truly see. Lord, open the eyes of the parents that are continually berating and bad-mouthing and screaming at their kids. Open their eyes. Help them see what's really, what's really happening. Lord, uh, the people that are in financial need, hardship, open their eyes so they can see your provision like a tsunami tidal wave coming upon them. Lord, open their eyes. This man got so flustered and, and, and so fearful because of what he saw. And the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes that he may see. This young man was walking in darkness and he's about to get exposed to the light. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and beheld the whole mountain was full of horses and chariots round about Elisha. There was an angel army that was stationed and garrisoned and encamped round about this prophet, and there was nothing to be afraid of. He's got an army of angels. Over in Isaiah, we read of, of King Hezekiah, and we read about the Syrian king Sennacherib that came against Jerusalem at that time. And there were 185,000 troops with Sennacherib, at least double what this army was. And one angel took care of every single one of them in one night. The Bible says the angel of the Lord drew his sword and walked through Sennacherib's armies. And when Sennacherib got up the next morning, he's the only one left. And he walked back to Syria. 
Here, this young man's eyes are open and he sees chariots of fire and, 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 and horses and the armies of heaven just stationed round about Elisha. You know, when you see that, all fear is gone. When you see that, when you see that, calm returns. And you roll your sleeves up and say, bring it. See, but, what, but how, did that, how did that take place? By one prophet saying, Lord, open his eyes. So I thought his eyes were open. They were, these eyes, these natural eyes. He had no spiritual perception whatsoever. You can't see angels. You can't see the Holy Spirit. You can't see the Lord walking in the midst of the churches. You can't see the glory of God unless he chooses that it would manifest, which several times in the Bible it did. But otherwise, you have to walk by faith. You have to walk according to what the Word of God says. So back to, back to Acts, and I better hurry up because we've got six more points uh, in, 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 in what he said here uh, to, uh, to this great apostle, the Apostle Paul. He says to him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And, and what's the purpose I'm sending you for? Number one, to open their eyes. What's number two? To turn them, to turn them, to turn them from darkness. So many people are living in darkness and don't even realize it. They don't, they, they, they can perceive natural darkness. Is there anyone here who has a problem going out at, at like one or two or three in the morning and perceiving that it's dark at that time of night? Man, I turkey hunt in the spring, and, and we get up at, we call it, oh, dark hundred. <laughs> and, and it's dark. And, 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 man, we're out there before the first little pink starts to paint the eastern sky. Some of you don't even know that time of day exists. <laughs> and, and, then the, and then the sun just slowly creeps up, and you just watch that first little sliver of it come up. And then if it's not cloudy, you, 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 get, to, you get to watch it come. There's, there's a difference between darkness and light. But most people walking in spiritual darkness don't discern it. They don't realize that there's, 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 there's confusion and, and, and they're stumbling through life because it's dark and they lack anything to light their way. And so he says to Paul, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to send you, and number one, to open their eyes to turn them. See, their eyes need to be open so they turn from darkness to light. Let me just give you a couple of verses uh, from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 42, Isaiah 42 and verse 7. Isaiah 42 and verse 7. And the Lord says to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Those that sit in darkness. Verse 16 in that same chapter says, I will bring the blind by by a way that they knew not, I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and make the crooked things straight. These things will I do to them and not forsake them. The Lord doesn't want anyone to sit in spiritual darkness. He wants them to walk clearly in the light, to have all the crooked places in their lives straightened out. And then lastly, uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Aren't you glad the light of God has shined on you and is shining before you? Another great verse uh, that, that, that I think of, of course, uh, is uh, Psalm 119. Uh, it, it says, Thy word is a, a lamp to my feet and a light and a light and a light to my path. He gave us his word so that we don't stumble in darkness, but that we have a light to guide our way in every relationship, in every situation and circumstance, in every area and arena of light. The word of God gives us light to penetrate the darkness and to light our path so that we know how to walk. And then he turned them from darkness, turned them from confusion, turned them, turned them from uh, that, that, that lost and nothing seems clear uh, unto, unto the light, unto light. John chapter 1 and verse 5, and, and, and this speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ in the beginning. Let's just start with verse 1. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Nothing was made except by him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light, there's our verse, verse 5, and the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. See, when the light of the glorious gospel, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4 talk about, when the light of the glorious gospel shine, darkness, is, darkness flees. Darkness is dissipated. Did you ever notice it can't ever get too dark for light to quit functioning? You, you don't have lights on in here, and then all of a sudden it just gets so dark we can't see the lights. That never happens. But it doesn't matter how dark it is, you can have just one little, this little light of mine, one little tiny, give me that little flashlight right out of that middle drawer, Aaron. Reach up there and open that middle drawer and toss me that flashlight. One little tiny single, single cell, yeah, that one. Single cell flashlight. And, and, and boy, we could turn every light off in here and that would just be so glowing and so bright and, and, and so brilliant. Uh, and then I'd hide it and say, who wants, who wants my light? Who, who wants me to give you some light? But, but just one little light like that. There, there's one minister who talks about some of the caves uh, down in southern Missouri. And you go hundreds and hundreds of feet down, way down into the depths of the, the, these caves. You're over 500 feet deep. And then they shut the lights off. Shut every light off. And he said, it's just penetrating. You can feel it. It just encompasses down around you. And then he lights one match. And he said, all of a sudden, your eyes adjust. You can see the walls. You can see all the faces of these dozens of people. And then, and then the other guy lights a match. And the other guy lights a match. And the light always expels the darkness. Always. There's never too much darkness that it overwhelms the light. Ever. Ever. Doesn't matter how much darkness there is, light always dispels darkness, not the other way around. John 8 and verse 12, Jesus spoke to them and said, I am the light. Yeah. I am the light of the world. Amen. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life but shall have the light of life. He's going to turn them from darkness, from deception, from confusion, from misunderstanding, and he's going to turn them to Jesus, the only true light. I am the light of the world, and he that follows me shall not walk in darkness. He shall have the light of life. A couple of verses that are, that are great verses along this line. Turn them from darkness to light. Open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light. Colossians chapter 1 and, and verse 13 says, He has delivered us. Isn't this good news, believers? Isn't this good news, Christians? Yeah. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And then how about this verse? How about this verse from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who has done what? called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In the times past, you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. In the past, you'd not obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. That verse tells you how to get out of the darkness and how to get into the light. It's the mercy of God. It's becoming one of the people of God. Now, the next thing, the next thing he, he, he's going to say is you're going to turn them from something to something. You're going to turn them from. So what's he say in verse 18 of Acts 26? You're going to turn them from the power or the authority or the influence. I like that word from one of the translation. The influence of Satan, and you're going to turn them to God. You're going to turn them to God. That means, that, see, if you turn toward something, now, now, what's that direction right there? That, that'd be west. That'd be west. That, that would make that east. Oh, no, no, no. I, <laughs> all right, no. That's west. That'd be south. And this would be north. And so if I'm going to turn toward the south, it means I was turned in a different direction. It means I was facing it. I might be facing west. I might be facing east. But I can't be facing south if I'm going to turn to the south. 
It means I was turned in a different direction. And, and so the influence of Satan, uh, well, let's be honest about it. The influence of the devil still impacts church people, still impacts good people, still impacts godly people, still impacts saved people. You don't have to have it all to you. When, when it talks about being under the influence of the devil, it, it doesn't mean you're just this horrible, mass murdering, vile. No, no, no. It just means you, 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 might, be, you might be facing southwest, but you're going to turn to the south. That means you've got a little bit of a turn to make. Or you might be facing completely away from God and under the influence of the, the, the devil and his temptations and, and, and his deception, and you don't even know it. You're just in the dark. You don't even know hate is wrong. You don't even know jealousy is a sin. You don't even know envy. You don't even know that murder in your heart is just as bad as if you had the ax in your hand and took them out. You don't know that. You don't know that selfishness and stinginess and looking out for number one. You don't know that pride is detestable in the sight of God. You don't know that. You're just under the influence of sin. And so you're just walking like this. And, 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 and the minister's job is to turn you from darkness to light, from the influence of Satan to God. Get you going in the right direction again. And that's exactly what he says to Paul. Your commission and your job is. And so let's talk just a minute, just a little bit about the influence of, of, of Satan, which if you want to write it down for me, uh, w with me, uh, it really can be covered in two areas, temptation and deception. Temptation and deception. The temptation to do wrong, the temptation to, to commit sin, that's not, that's not a sin in itself. You can be tempted to do a lot of things and resist that temptation. I mean, that driver in front of you, you are tempted to just run into him and just blow him out of the way. You wish you had a big old V-plow on the front of your truck and you could just get it. Relax, take a deep breath. You didn't submit to the temptation. Now here's what the Bible teaches. Being tempted is not a sin. Yielding to the temptation and doing it if it's wrong, that's a sin. But being tempted is not, you know, I walk by something in the, in the jewelry store and it looks so nice and I don't have money to buy it and nobody's around and it's still laying on the top. What's the temptation? You're not tempted to take it and put it back in the and lock it and stand there and guard over it. To, that's not a temptation. If you do that, that's the Lord. No, the temptation is just take it, put it in your pocket and kind of self-justify. I, I deserve this. I'm a, you know, I work hard. I paid my taxes. <laughs> temptation and deception pretty much cover the influence of the devil in people's lives. Now look at this verse. Watch this verse. He again, he's talking to the minister. This is, this is Paul. Maybe he learned something. He's teaching this young minister, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, 25, and 26. Now watch this. But the servant of the Lord must not strive. That means must not get into arguments and, and, and fisticuffs with people. Must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Able to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who are in opposition even unto themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. Now watch the last verse. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have been taken captive by him at his will. Yield to temptation, it opens it up, and now they're captives. And he says the servant of the Lord's job is to help people get out of that snare. You know what a snare is? It's a trap. It's a trap. Now, I've got a couple snares. I, I, I've never even used a snare. I've never set a snare. I've set foot traps and, and caught critters, uh, and, and, and I, I've set little, little coon cuffs, especially when those coons start ripping my bird feeders up. I declare war. And then I've got some live traps. And, and, and those are big cages, boxes, and you put a little bait in there, and, 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 and you know, they, they, they crawl in there and snap. And they're caught. And they're caught. And, and you go down there and you look at them, you know, and they're so sweet. And they got these big old brown eyes. They're like, oh, please have mercy on me. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning. <laughs> Paul
Paula catches chipmunks that way. She's got a little bitty live trap. How many did you catch last year? Like 45 chipmunks around her house. They better hope the mercies are new every morning. And she takes them, and she picks them up in that little cage, and she puts them in the car. Of course, the dogs are going crazy. They want them. And, but she puts them in her car, and then she drives them, and she drives them. They get a ride in Mrs. Clements' car, and she <laughs> takes them over the river and through the woods, and, and, and she gets a long ways away, three rivers between us and them. And, and, then, and then she opens the door, and they just go like, I mean, they, they never, ever dribble out. It's like they're shot out of a cannon. When you open the door of that trap, they are so happy to be free. It's like, woo and they're shot out of that cage and boom, across, the, across the ground. And, and, and you, you never have to like, don't you want to get out or anything? It's like stay out of the way when you, when, you, when you lift that door. But people, human beings, to, 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 to my great surprise, they're in the snare of the devil. And it's my job in life to open that door and say, I can help you out of there. And then they fight to stay in. They, they want to stay arrogant and prideful. They, 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 they want to stay consumed with their habits. They, 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 they don't want to be told that what they are and what they're doing and, 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 and that is hateful, that that's wrong. They, they, don't want, they, they want to hate. They want to hold bitterness and hold grudges. And, and, and they want to hold unforgiveness. And they want to be stingy. And they want to be selfie and they, selfish. And they fight to stay in. I think all humans ought to be as smart as a chipmunk. I mean, I mean, just think about it. I mean, their, their brain is about as big as an M&M. <laughs> but even they know when somebody opens the door, boom, I'm out of here. He says to Paul, I, I want you to turn them from the influence of Satan to God. I want you to turn them, the influence of deception and temptation to God. Turn to God. Turn to God. Turn to God. Well, pastor, you're talking to, I'm a believer. I'm a church member. I'm saved. I've been a believer for 50 years. Uh, I've been, turn to God. You might be so, south, south, south by southwest, and you just need to turn just a little bit. Turn to God. Turn to God. And even if you've got just one pinky in the trap. I caught a fox one time, had one toe in the trap. Just one little claw. That's all. One claw off the end of the toe. It was easy to let him out. I just, just tossed my coat over him, opened up that trap, and got his foot out of there. I wasn't after him. I was after his bigger cousin. And, 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 and so I let him go. Just one claw. And, 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 and just popped that open, and, and whew, he left, had my coat. He, he, got, he got out of it. You trap coons. You trap a raccoon. He'll get his foot in that, in that trap. Greg, he'll chew it off. He will chew his foot right off rather than stay in that trap, and humans want to stay right in the trap they're in. Humans want to, they, they, it, it, it means more to them than freedom. Praise God, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You can be free of anything. You can be free of everything. Turn them from, from darkness to light. Turn them from that deception and temptation, the power uh, and influence of Satan. Turn them to God. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Come on, real, real quick, I'm just going to give you... Just a few verses. Isaiah 55, uh, 6 and 7. Say, uh, sir, seek, uh, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Now, now let's analyze this verse for a while. Uh, it looks to me like you have to seek God or you're not going to find him. That you have to call upon him or he's not going to answer. He said in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee. And so many people are waiting for God to do something miraculous and powerful in life, but they're not doing their part. Turn from darkness to light. Turn from the influence of Satan to God. You have to do something. And then he's waiting there to help you. Seek and call upon him. Next verse. Let the wicked forsake his way. That's called repentance. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. 
Isn't that great news? Yeah. Isn't that great news? He didn't say he'll turn you away. The Bible says whoever comes to the Lord, he will in not any way push aside. He'll never reject you. He will never reject you. That's a deception of the devil. Say, oh, you can't come to God. You're too ugly. You're too ornery. You're, you're too sinful. You're, you're, too, you're too haughty. You're too, you're too much of a heathen. You can't come to God. Anybody can come to the Lord. Anybody can turn and, and draw near to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. This is Jesus, and he says, come unto me. Come unto me. See, he already came. Now it's up to you to draw near to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my, my burden is light. Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. You'll find me when you search for me with your whole heart. <coughs> James 4, 8 says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. That's a verse to the believers. That's a verse to Christians. That's a verse to church folk. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And then, and then this one, Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus, and, and he's standing at the door. And he says, if any man will hear my voice and open up that door. Do you hear his voice this morning? Yeah. Open that door and invite him in, and you can have fellowship with him and, 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 and sweet communion with him. Now, he, he says all of this, he says, I'm sending you to open their eyes, to turn them, Turn them from darkness to light, from the influence of Satan to God, that they may receive, that they may receive. The Lord wants every human being to receive, that they may receive. He's sending him to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the influence of Satan to God, so that they may receive. You can't stay in darkness and receive. You can't stay influenced by Satan and receive. God wants you to receive. I've sent you to open their eyes so that they'll turn from darkness to light, the influence of Satan to God, so that they may receive two things. The first, forgiveness of their sins. Forgiveness of their sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Not my good works, not my promises to do better, not my sorrow, not my regret. Well, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry for doing that. that, that, that that's not enough to receive forgiveness of sins. To receive forgiveness of sins, I have to do something. What is it that I have to do? I just simply have to ask. I just simply have to ask. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, If you'll confess your sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive you. To forgive you. To forgive you. Now, if I do something against my brother, if I steal something from him, if I, if I criticize him or judge him without cause, uh, I may need to go and I may need to make amends with him and say, brother, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I stole your tie. Uh, I didn't mean to. I didn't have one. I like it now, so I'm going to keep it. But please, for no, I know I didn't, I didn't give it back. No, but, but see, I may have to ask him. And then it's clear between us. You forgive me? Smart man. Go ahead. Have a seat. So we're clear. But that doesn't take care of it with me and the Lord. Because it was his word that I violated. Yeah. I didn't just sin against my brother or my sister. I sinned against him. And then I have to confess that as sin to him. And he's faithful and he's just, and he'll forgive me. Did you see it right there? And he'll forgive you and cleanse you of anything that's not right. Amen. You don't have to be concerned about, well, you know, I did this, I did that. I've done this for so long. Maybe, maybe, maybe he can't forgive that. There's no sin he won't forgive. There's nothing short of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which you haven't done, uh, that, that, that isn't forgiven. And not only that, it says he'll cleanse you of all, all, all unrighteousness. Let's look at these verses real quick. Acts 2.38. Acts 
Acts 2.38, you can look at them up on the screen, jot them down, look at them later. Acts 2.38, Peter says, repent. See, that's turned from darkness, that's turned from the influence of Satan. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 3 and verse 19, Acts 3 and verse 19, it says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins be blotted out, and that times of refreshing shall come in the presence of the Lord. Isaiah 1 and verse 18, isn't this just a beautiful, beautiful verse right here? Isaiah 1 and verse 18, Come now, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be red as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They they be red like crimson, they'll be white as wool. Only he can do that. Only he can do that. In the eighth chapter of the book of Hebrews, he, he, he says, he, he says that uh, verse 12, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. I will remember them no more. He repeats that in chapter 10, verse 6, 17. And, and their sins and iniquities, I will remember them no more. Uh, have you sinned? Every human has. All sinners raise a hand. Every human in the whole human race, all eight billion of us would have a hand in the air. Yep. Yeah, maybe not the infants and babies, but, but uh, everyone who's, who's come to the age of accountability and knows right from wrong. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone's in the same boat. The Bible says he's concluded all under sin so that he can have mercy on us all. That's what our Bible says. The Lord wants to forgive you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to cleanse you and wash you. He's just waiting for you to ask. That's all it takes is a simple request. Our God doesn't force anything on anyone. Uh, our God only provides and gives. Now, the last thing he says that they may receive, number one here was forgiveness, and number two is an inheritance. An inheritance. Much in the Bible, much in the New Testament uh, is, is, is made of, of this particular term, uh, inheritance. Uh, what is an inheritance? What's an inheritance? Well, it's a benefit. It's usually something good. It's something that's profitable to you, advantageous to you, desirable to you. And how does it come to you? It comes to you when the person that promised it to you dies. That's what an inheritance is. It's something you receive after the death of one who's promised it to you. As long as that person is alive, you don't enjoy the benefit of the inheritance. Paul and I have a will written out. We figured out a long time ago that being ready for the end of life doesn't, doesn't make it come real quick. So like 20 years ago, we wrote out a will. Uh, and uh, we, we left everything in our will to our two children. But ask them how much of it they've received. Because we haven't died yet. And we're enjoying it now. They can enjoy it later. They can get what's left. If anything. <laughs> I'm in my dad's will. I'm the executor of his will. I've seen it. I've read every detail. I've reviewed it. I haven't, I haven't received anything that's in the will. None of my inheritance has come to me yet. Because he hasn't died yet. Everything that the Lord Jesus Christ promised to provide you and I, the blessed presence of the Holy Spirit within His guidance, His direction, the peace that surpasses all understanding, forgiveness of our sins and cleansing of our wicked ways, the joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, the love of God that's shed abroad in our heart, healing for our physical bodies, provision for our everyday needs, favor with God and all men, Everything that he's promised of, joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, that's part of our inheritance. And you know when you can receive it? 
not after you go to heaven because you don't receive the inheritance after you die. You receive the inheritance after he dies. And he died on the cross of Calvary. He died and he was buried and he descended and paid the price for three days for the forgiveness of our sin. And then he rose again. And now he's back to life. But what he provided and what's written in the New Testament that belongs to us, that's part of the covenant blessing, that is part of your inheritance, that belongs to you right now. Amen. That belongs to you right now. Amen. That belongs to you and I right now. Acts 20, 32. Only got two more scriptures. Acts 20 and verse 32. This is Paul. And he says, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Same thing he told Paul right here. He, he says to these ministers, he says, I commend you. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that's able to build you up and give you an inheritance. The inheritance is everything that belongs to you as a Christian, everything that belongs to you because of what Christ did. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, and then verse 18 speaks of the inheritance. It says, which is the earnest. Now, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, if you go back and look at verse 13. The Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the Spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit, who is, next verse, who is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Verse 18 in the same chapter talks about the inheritance. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened. We read this once, didn't we? We read this, that we'd, we'd ask the Lord for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would know the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance really is to us. You have a grand, glorious inheritance. Don't wait till you get to heaven to, to benefit from what Jesus did for you. That's for right now. He, he, he's, he died, but he did raise again, conquered death, came out of the grave, and he lives forevermore. Last verse, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, that is reserved in heaven for you. Well, pastor, I thought you just said we didn't have to wait till we got to heaven for the inheritance. You know, isn't this great? Uh, he died and you're gonna get inheritance in this life and in the life which is to come. Right here while you're on planet earth and there's part of your inheritance that you'll never receive. I don't know how many times I've gotten the opportunity to just encourage Christian people that, that the greatest of the blessings that you have, oh, as wonderful as it can be to walk with our God and to know the Lord, the, 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 the sweetness of His presence, to know His forgiveness, to the, have the assurance of salvation, to have the presence of the Lord in your life, <coughs> to have peace to know joy. As wonderful as that is, the greatest blessing and benefit of being a Christian awaits you in heaven. You'll never see it in this lifetime. The glory that shall be revealed to us is not worthy to be compared to the sufferings of this lifetime. There's nothing, in, nothing like this over there. Nothing like this over there. We should live with the excitement of stepping into eternity. No regret, no hesitation, no holding back. The greatest moment in my whole life is when I step out of this body and I'm in the Lord's presence. And all the suffering, crying, sighing, dying are over with and done. And there's no more death and no more pain and no more sickness and no more loneliness. All the former things have passed away. That awaits you in heaven. Let me look at that verse one more time. Glory to God. To an inheritance, this is where we're headed, to an inheritance incorruptible, that means no corruption in it, it'll never pass away, never wear out, never rust, 
undefiled, it's pure, perfect in every way. It, not, it does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. There's, there, there's, there's, there's some great things reserved in heaven for you. Are you going to make it there to receive them? Only if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, will you? Only if you have a personal walk and relationship with you. All over this sanctuary, let's bow our heads and pray. Those of you streaming, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being with us on this Mother's Day. If you are a mom, God bless you. We prayed for you earlier and, and, uh, and we honor you this day, both there streaming with us, watching this broadcast uh, and, and the tape of this message, the recording of it later and here in the sanctuary. But if you're watching and you're streaming, I'm gonna ask the same thing of you. That if today, this very day, I'm not gonna embarrass you, no one's looking around, I'm not gonna call you out. I just wanna simply ask the question, this very day, do you know absolutely you have the absolute assurance that you're going to heaven because of your acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that inheritance that's waiting there. One day you'll walk right in and you'll step right into to, to that. You know that for a fact. Put your hand up for one second, put it right back down. You absolutely have that assurance. If you're watching on the, uh, 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 on the stream, if you're viewing this later, if you're here in the sanctuary, if you don't have that assurance, I'm not gonna embarrass you. This is between you and God. If I see one person's hand, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. We're all gonna pray it together. Then we're gonna eat cake and go home and celebrate Mother's Day. If you're in this sanctuary this morning and you say, Pastor, I've never accepted Jesus Christ personally. I've never put my hope and faith in him in a personal way, but I'd like to today. I wanna to make heaven and I wanna enjoy Christianity here now and there then. And I wanna make sure of that. I wanna do that today. Lift your hand up for one second and then put it right back down. I saw that hand, anyone else? I can't see your hands, obviously, that are, that, are, that are streaming. Anyone want to join him and say, today, I want to put my faith in Christ? Look one more time. All right, those of you streaming, let's all pray together. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, pray right with me. Mean it from your heart. Don't just mimic and parrot what I say. Heavenly Father, today I come to you. And I accept what your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, did for me on the cross. I put my trust in Jesus as Savior and Jesus as Lord of my life. Thank you that he came. Thank you that he died for me. Thank you that you raised him from the dead. And thank you that he now lives for me. I trust in Jesus and nothing else. That in the end, I might stand before him and be accepted into heaven forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Have our altar minute. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.